And the next item in order paper is a motion on autism. The business committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Clerk, please read the motion. That this assembly expresses concern over the waiting times for children for autism and special educational needs assessments. Notes that the prevalence of autism, including Asperger's syndrome, in school aged children in Northern Ireland 2015 report, published in July 2015, shows that the estimated prevalence of autism has increased. Recognises that delays in diagnosis are resulting in children with special educational needs being denied access to the extra educational support they need. Further notes the importance of early intervention for educational and social development for these children and calls on the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety to work collaboratively with the Minister of Education and his arm's length bodies to invest fully in and streamline service to deal with the backlog. Thank you. Well done. It's a long motion. I call Mr Dominic Bradley to move the motion. Then Shahanu, Conan Rune Shah, Awalu, Don Tonolan Shah. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm pleased to be in the position to um, propose this motion here today. Um, uh, as you may know, uh, I have been for a long time an advocate of good services for uh, people with autism, both children and adults. Uh, and uh, I must say that the, this House has been responsive to the uh, needs of people with autism and uh, passed the Autism Act uh, in 2010-11. And I, I was, of course, very proud to have my name as sponsor uh, of that bill. And the uh, Autism Act recognised autism uh, not just as a health issue, not just as an education issue, but as a cross-departmental issue, and also uh, as a, a, de a developmental disability. Since then, Mr. Uh, Speaker, we have had the Autism Strategy 2013 to 2020, and the accompanying uh, Action Plan 2013 to 2016. The Autism Strategy is a cross-departmental strategy introduced by uh, the Health Minister and addressing the whole life needs of people, family uh, and carers living with autism in Northern Ireland. The Act required the Health Minister to lead on the development, implementation, monitoring and reporting of the new strategy with other departments obliged to cooperate. And of course, the Minister of Health is responsible and accountable to this House for the implementation of the Act. So what a disappointment it is, Mr Speaker, that the Health Minister is not here today to respond to, to the, the various points made by uh, those who will speak in this debate. I am extremely concerned about the waiting times for special educational needs assessments, and this motion is calling on the Minister for Health uh, and the Minister for Education to work together uh, to ensure uh, that uh, waiting times for uh, diagnosis, for uh, intervention, and for state venting will be reduced. The backlog uh, under the present circumstances, with no Minister for Health in place, uh, will only get worse. So, Mr. Speaker, there can be no doubt about it that autism uh, and special educational needs are both uh, the uh, on the radar of the Minister for Education, we have the current uh, special educational needs legislation making its way through this House. Uh, ASD has uh, been on previous Health Minister's agenda 
with the aut autism strategy and the autism plan. But uh, unfortunately, I cannot say the same for the present minister, who is a uh, minister for health, who is not even present here in the House today. The Special Educational Needs Bill has many aims. It will place a duty on the Education Authority to request help from the Health and Social Care Trusts in all, in all cases where it considers that these bodies could help in the exercise of its functions. Uh, and very importantly, it would contribute to the wider policy aim of reducing the time frame for completion of statutory assessment and issue of a final statement by the authority uh, from 26 to 20 weeks. Uh, the Minister for Health launched the autism strategy last year and its aim uh, is to ensure that all government departments uh, work together to improve support for those living with autism. And this is exactly what our motion here today is asking for, for that collaborative, for that joined up working between these two departments who were required by the Autism Act to work together on this issue. The motion refers to the prevalence of autism, including Asperger's syndrome in school children in Northern Ireland, uh, the report issued in 2015. This report has brought forward some thought-provoking figures. It has given us no doubt that autism is more prevalent in society today than it was six years ago. In the last five years, the rate of autism has increased by 67% in school-aged children, with one in 54 pupils attending school being diagnosed with ASD. The prevalence of autism has increased by nearly 1% between 2009-10 and 14-15, from 1.3% to 2.2%. In 2009-10, there were 3,668 children with ASD out of a school age population of 270,000. 2014-15, there were uh, 6,045 children with a ASD out of a school population which uh, hadn't increased very much. So, Mr. Speaker, it is very clear uh, that the prevalence of autism is increasing in our society, but that is not being accompanied by the necessary uh, increase in support and services and by the necessary increase, uh, sorry, in decrease uh, in uh, waiting times for diagnosis and for early intervention. The report also highlights that males are five times more likely to be identified as ASD than females, although the number of females is rising. And although this report has highlighted this, and brought the numbers to our attention, we are still aware of the growing pressure of the number of children, young people and adults, uh, and the challenge that this pressure uh, places on already fragile autism services. There is no doubt that without early and speedier diagnosis, children with ASD and special educational needs will not get the support that they require in school or through the health service. And I cannot stress enough that one of the key aspects of ensuring that children with autism develop to their fullest potential is early intervention, early diagnosis and early statementing. The current target for assessment uh, is 13 weeks. At the end of April, 1,449 children were waiting for assessment. More than 900 had been waiting longer than the recommended 13 weeks. And of those, 476 uh, had been waiting more than 26 weeks. And more than 78 children had been waiting over a year to be assessed. These are children, Mr. Speaker, 
uh, who, if they are found to have ASD, uh, will not have got the support that they require in school and outside of school during the time that they have spent waiting for a diagnosis to be complete. And in an answer, uh, Mr. Speaker, to an oral question asked by my colleague John Dallet in June of this year, the Minister for Health said that the Health and Social Care Board is working to reduce the number and length, uh, and length of time that children and young people have to wait for assessment. He has said that autism services have been, uh, have been unable to keep pace with the growing demand. In 2010, there were approximately 1,500 referred for autism services, and this, Mr. Speaker, has nearly doubled to 2,936 uh, in March of this year. The Minister finished his answer to that particular oral question by assuring the House that the Department was working to see new ways of reducing the impact of the long waits for assessments. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, we have not seen those way, new ways come to any fr uh, fruition. And perhaps the call that Thank will you. go out from the House today. I call Ms. May from McLaughlin. and I welcome the opportunity as member of the Education Committee to. Um, to speak on this important uh, debate today, and I, I acknowledge and thank the proposer of the motion for bringing it forward. Uh, it's very clear that the motion highlights the prevalence of autism and how it has increased, uh, and rightly notes the importance of early intervention. It calls on the Minister for Health to work collaboratively with the Minister for Education and the arm's length bodies to fully invest in and to streamline services and dealing with this backlog. It is our view, however, Kian Korler, that this needs to go much further, that there needs to be a formal duty of cooperation between health and education to deal with special educational needs. Put frankly, there are too many gaps in the sharing of information between the two departments that are impacting on children and families. Clause 4 of the draft SEND bill gives us an opportunity to do just that. It does place a duty on the Education Authority to request help from health and social care bodies when it is considered necessary. It is my view that this needs to be much stronger and should ultimately place a formal duty for both departments to cooperate. And I say that, Akeon Korler, because the majority of the delays in the statement and process lay at the door of the Health and Social Care Trusts. During the quarter ended 30th of June 2015, 682 children had been referred for an assessment for autism spectrum disorder. This was an increase of 18 per cent in the previous quarter. The estimated prevalence of autism, including Asperger's of school-aged children, has increased by 67 per cent across all health and social care trusts between 2008-09 and 2013-14. And indeed, the school census figures for 14-15 found that 6,045 children were identified with ASD. The proposer of the motion has referred to the significant difference between genders, with males almost five times more likely to be identified with ASD than females. However, the analysis has now indicated that female ASD population in recent years has increased at slightly higher rates than males. The same analysis shows us that the rate of ASD for the 10 per cent most deprived areas stood at 2,818 cases per 100,000 of the population which is a third higher than the so-called regional rate. On the 31st of March 2015, there was 1,383 children on waiting lists for a diagnosis of ASD, a stark reality for all of us. And we're told that in 
1.64 million recurrent funding was provided for children with children's autism services, and a further allocation of 250,000 was made in 13-14. The new SEND bill, the draft SEND bill, reflects on the time limits to issue a final statement. But the stark fact remains that in 2013-14, 59% of statements were made after the statutory period of 26 weeks. That is somewhere in the region of 1,317 children who were waiting over the statutory time for an assessment. And indeed, backed up further by a 2010 survey that found that just 14% of teachers believed that there was a coherent approach across health and education in supporting children with SEM. So I want Ken Corler to support the motion. It is right that we move to models of early intervention and early diagnosis. However, we do need to see better formal working relationships between health and education, and that, in my view, should take the nature of a formal duty to cooperate between both departments. I support the motion. Yeah, I call Ms Sandra Overend. Mr. Speaker, and I speak initially on behalf of the uh, Education Committee um, as, as Vice Chairman. I would like to thank the proposers of, the, of the bringing forward this motion this afternoon for debate. The subject matter coincides very much with the Committee's consideration of the Special Educational Needs and Disability Bill. Earlier speakers have highlighted the increasing demand for SEN support services in schools, the variation in those services across Northern Ireland and the apparent complexity of assessment and referral arrangements. Given all this, it is therefore unsurprising that there are a relatively large number of assessments which are taking place well beyond the statutory time scales. It is perhaps also unsurprising that most members in their constituency surgeries are frequently faced with complaints from frustrated parents who simply want to make sure that their child gets the support that they need at school. During our consideration of the SEND bill, the committee has received a lot of explanations and many assurances from the Department of Education, the Education Authority and from relevant health arm's length bodies. If these are to be accepted at face, face value, then there is no problem. Health and education are cooper, cooperating marvelously and at every possible opportunity. Wonderful protocols are being developed. Liaison groups are hitting their stride and regional allied health professional services in support of SEN, if not actually always available, are, according to officials, imminent. Well, the problem the committee has is reconciling these departmental assertions with the reality as experienced by our constituents. I believe the Education Committee essentially, and in this regard, simply doesn't accept what it has been told by officials. Consequently, and in line with the Children's Services Cooperation Bill, Members are thinking seriously about new statutory obligations on arm's length bodies to cooperate in the delivery of SEN services. I think, Mr. Speaker, that part of our consideration of these new obligations will be coloured by the success or otherwise of the Autism Act in improving access to education for children with ASD. Mr. Speaker, speaking now as the Ulster Unionist spokesperson for education and a Mid Ulster MLA. In the last five weeks since the beginning of the school term, I have been inundated with concerns from parents, on average two to three per week, which really is an astounding number uh, this year regarding the education provision for their children, whether it's about a delay in the assessment of their children or if they're receiving the right amount of educational assistance. And, for, and school principals and teachers have been highlighting to me their exasperation of the system Often they're told that they can only refer one or two children during the school year for assessment. Mr. Speaker, think about how that conversation would go. A school principal has to inform a parent that their child is not a high, as high a priority as another child in their school. What does that do for a staff-parent relationship? Surely this type of action puts a strain on such a relationship and causes bad feeling and ultimately could break down further educational achievement for that child. I wonder what the rationale is behind this uh, decision only to allow uh, schools to only refer 
uh, a limited number of children. <coughs> the cynical me says it's to limit waiting lists uh, with, with the system. I have no doubt that there is very good work ongoing by officials within the educational authority and I've talked to various educational psychologists who are working very hard but there is much to be done to improve the situation. I, I refer back to figures that, a, that was revealed back in October last year that the Northern Health and Social Trust showed that as of the end of August last year there were 105 <coughs> children waiting more than 13 weeks for an assessment. That is simply not good enough. More often than not, these assessments will find that a child has quite complex needs. This is an already an anxious time for families who are worried about their children and keen to have as much detailed information as possible about their condition. Having to wait months for appointments is only adding to the stress. An early diagnosis is essential in order to put in place the help and support that a child needs, both at home and at school. A diagnostic AASD assessment will give parents and teachers the information that they need to determine the level of support that a child will require, ensuring they will not be at a disadvantage in the education system. It is vital that the Trust takes actions. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, uh, this motion is calling for cross-department collaboration, something that we have been calling for time and time again, and frankly, the people of Northern Ireland deserve better. Thank you. And Mr. Okay. Kieran McCarthy is the next speaker in this debate, but uh, as the business committee has arranged to meet at 1 p.m. today, I propose, therefore, by leave of the assembly, to suspend the sitting until 2 p.m. And the first item of business, when we return, will be question time. The sitting is by leave suspended. Thank you. <coughs> Members, we now return to the debate on autism, and I call Kieran McCarthy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in con yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, I welcome the opportunity this afternoon to support this motion on the uh, problems associated with autism, and indeed to express, express my deep disappointment that following the Autism Act Northern Ireland 2011, very little progress has been made. I want to declare to the Assembly that I have been a long-standing member of the uh, all-party group on autism and have a fair knowledge of the problems experienced by people with autism and indeed their families. It has been a long and arduous campaign which really started as far back as 2001, some 14 years ago, and I wholeheartedly congratulate the officers and volunteers from Autism NI, our all-party group on autism led by Chair Dominic Bradley and indeed others for their perseverance and success despite the opposition at the highest level right here within the Northern Ireland Assembly and indeed the Department of Health and Social Care. The whole idea of legislation was to ensure people with autism had access to equality, the same as everyone else in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, to date, to the eternal shame of the departments, education alongside of health, many aspects of the Autism Act has fallen far short of expectations. Mr. Speaker, it would appear the Act has been breached in a number of areas, and um, I have got to express total and absolute disgust, and I ask the question, where is the six steps to autism? Where is the autism awareness campaign? Where is the necessary extra funding for autism? What's happening to the ever-increasing waiting lists? These are all questions, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the Department needs to answer, and answer rather quickly. Remembering the Autism Act came into being way back in 2011. It is indeed most unfortunate, but a sad reality of the situation in relation to autism, that the number of children with the condition continues to increase, and the number of parents and guardians continue to be exasperated because of the delay, the long delay, in the diagnosis and the remedies put in place to give the best possible result and outcomes for all concerned. Mr Deputy Speaker, this anomaly applies to both the Health Department and the Education Department and indeed other departments and everyone in positions of authority. They really must listen to the deliberations 
from this assembly that today and the members who have spoken and will, will speak and pull out all the stops to ensure the delivery of a much improved service. There is one thing that really annoys me, Mr Deputy Speaker, and that is, as being an Assembly member, and we have to listen to the cries for help from so many families when they are told their child, and in some cases more than one child, has autism. And me not being in a position to give definitive answers as to what happens next. Mr Speaker, the Autism Act 2011 Northern Ireland should be the catalyst for directions to parents and guardians who need help and assistance at a very important time in the life of that child. The Autism Strategy and Action Plan was introduced to this Assembly on 14 January 2014 and contained in that document were many positive ideas and pathways aimed at the better awareness on the way forward for the child and its parents. I am not so sure some 18 months later that parents actually do know where to go for help and assistance. It is my understanding that while schools, their principals and teachers are totally committed to give the best service to all children who have autism, but they continue to be restricted because of the lack of funding and classroom support, which really must be tackled and answers provided as soon as possible. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am again disgusted that no Health Minister has presented themselves in this chamber today to hear the heartfelt appeals by all Assembly members, exactly the same as was last week on the disgusting waiting lists, yesterday for cancer treatment for so many sick people who continue to live in pain and agony. And this Assembly, through its Health Minister, shirks its duty and leaves people to their own suffering. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Autism Act Northern Ireland 2011 was hard won by the efforts of so many people, and I, I commend the many autism groups set up right across Northern Ireland to help local people find the way forward. Let the officials in all departments in this Assembly get to work immediately and implement at the earliest possible date the contents of the Autism Bill for the betterment of everyone with autism and their families. Thank you. Call Ms. Michaela Boyle. I'll get uh, Can I thank the proposer of the motion for bringing this uh, to the House today? Uh, Ken Colia, much of the discussion here today has centred on waiting times for assessment and the frustrations met by all involved, children, parents and schools. I want to focus a bit wider on the overall system and the bureaucracy that still exists within the system and the process. Since the ministerial statement of January the 14th, 2014, on the Autism Strategy and Action Plan from Minister Putz, the then Minister outlined that there needs to be a coherent cross-departmental development of an inclusive framework and that the Executive's commitment to improve services for children, young people, parents, carers and families to improve the services that are provided to those living with autism. Firstly, I would like to commend all those involved in that hard work bringing this strategy forward. However, I, along with parents, are concerned that the recommendations within that strategy are not being thoroughly developed and implemented through the department, and the outcomes have not necessarily impacted on the ground. Within the statement, it indicated that the regional coordinator will report to the interdepartmental senior officials which in return will report to the Minister who will lay a monitoring report on the implementation of the strategy before the Assembly at least every three years. Still layers of bureaucracy. In my opinion, and that of parents' reporting, should be viewed at least every 12 months in order to continue to look at the gaps therein. As the prevalence of the Autism Report indicates, Children in the least and most deprived areas appear to have the highest incident rate of ACD, ASD across all school years, and this has increased between 2009 and 2010 and 2014 and 2015, with the greatest rise in numbers of children with ASD in the youngest years of 5 to 8-year-olds and older children 13 to 16-year-olds. All of this indicates that waiting lists for assessments will get longer and longer 
on top of already as what is in the logjam. The five-stage process of identifying needs assessments needs to, be needs to be replaced by a less bureaucratic, straightforward assessment. I believe this would be a better model, and it may be less bureaucratic, but it has to have the mechanisms within it at least to reduce the waiting times for assessments. We all know early identification of need is key to making any progress. The earlier the assessment and intervention, which is paramount to enable children to reach their individual potential. If children and young people are not having their needs met promptly, this can lead to long-term and extensive interventions at a later stage in a child's education. Within many of our schools and our nurseries, principals, teachers and classroom assistants, SENCO coordinators and governors, there is a clear consensus that further training and development for teachers and support staff should continue to be rolled out. All schools need to be equipped with the necessary knowledge and skills to successfully manage the needs of children with autism, Asperger's, special educational needs and a disability. Schools also need the capacity uh, and expertise to take on the extra responsibilities that comes with the growing demand and increase in the numbers of children with ASD and Asperger's. Teachers along with the health care professionals need time to build capacity for this. It is time we move forward with the SEN bill, and I am aware this is at committee stage, and it is time the Health Minister got back to his desk to take responsibility over this issue. The multidisciplinary teams within health and education, which are the two lead departments for this, and their officials within, need to be continuing to engage with those involved in meeting the needs of children across the sectors, not just to address the waiting times, but further investment needs to be had to deal with the backlog. This is vitally crucial for a successful educational outcome for children with SEN needs. I want to pay tribute to all those groups and organisations who work with families and communities to enable to empower children and young people with SEN needs to actively engage in opportunities and live an active and full life Bring like the organisation in my own hometown, Sands, who do tremendously good work. I support the motion. I call Mr Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And as SDLP Health Spokesperson at South Belfast uh, MLA, I am privileged that my party is moving today's uh, motion. Um, I am hopeful that the Minister for Education and uh, the absentee Simon Hamilton uh, take heed of today's debate, as it is a very important issue. Uh, so important, in fact, that we have launched now an online petition uh, today, uh, which is reflecting on his absence and urging him to get back to work. Um, uh, it's a petition that was just launched a couple of hours ago and already 200 people have responded. The nature of the petition is they can also leave responses, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And Patricia O'Neill from Newton Abbey describes it as outrageous. Terry Ruddy from Newry says we need all ministers at Stormont at their desks and working for all of the people of Northern Ireland. Conor Duncan from Asharkin uh, says we deserve a full-time health minister delivering for our doctors and staff. Uh, and that gives you an indication, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of the strength of opinion that's out there around this issue. People live, if you like, um, uh, uh, reporting on their anxiety and annoyance at the present situation, and ignoring, ignoring this very important debate that all of the people that have turned up in the chamber agree is one that needs action and needs action now. Autumn, autism is a uh, a lifelong developmental disability, and it affects how a person communicates and makes sense of the world around them. It's a spectrum condition, uh, 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 so while all children and young people affected share certain difficulties uh, around social communication and interaction, it affects them all in different ways. And that's why diagnosis is so important for special educational needs provision. As already noted by previous speakers, uh, we've gone through some of the statistics, but in ASD terms, diagnosis in schools has risen dramatically over recent years from just under 4,000 in 2009-10 to over 6,000 last year, which rep represents a prevalence rate of some 2.2%. I have no doubt 
that increasing awareness has led to that, but also increasing levels of diagnosis have played a key role. And in that context, we must recognise the very important and professional role that the uh, uh, professionals, uh, such as education psychologists, play uh, in, in this, but also recognise the extreme pressure that they are under as the numbers increase. Uh, but the uh, wider financial provision for them uh, does not match it. There are over 1,300 children on waiting lists for autism diagnosis in order to receive the extra help and care that they need. The diagnosis forms an important component of the overall statementing process, and uh, its failure is failing children and their parents and all of us. My constituency office in South Belfast, for example, has been inundated with parents who are facing significant delays. Adam is a young boy. He's eight years old. His mother contacted the office in June, well ahead of the academic term. Um, but he'd been, he's been waiting now six months for an appointment. His mother is desperate to make sure that her son receives the help that he needs in primary school. He's still not been assessed, he's still attending a mainstream school, and the current situation, in her words, is that it's tearing her family apart. But Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Deputy Speaker, this isn't an isolated incident. Parents of children with autism are rapidly losing confidence in the education authority and the health system in providing statutory statements, and we need to do something to resolve this situation immediately. And the suggestion uh, of uh, a formal needs uh, assessment and a formal process between the two departments is a, a, a welcome one. It's clear that proper funding and joined up government is also needed to address this issue fully. A properly funded cross departmental focus is paramount in improving their quality of life while also ensuring uh, that these children receive an education on an equitable basis so that they can go into further education or otherwise lead a, a productive working life. There are many uh, people in community groups uh, and voluntary groups who are doing all that they can to support struggling parents. I have been particularly uh, impressed by Pete NI. Uh, there are other groups in South Belfast who are looking after uh, small constituencies of 20 and 25 families uh, with children who have autism. And it's groups like these that often go unrecognised. And they have told me that the Education Authority and the Department of Health are failing to ensure that they are getting the adequate provision, which leads them to try and take their own actions, uh, uh, which can sometimes mitigate but would be much improved if the Department and the Government listened. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Call Mr. Chris Hazard. Well, and can I thank those who have brought the motion here today? I think it's a very important uh, motion, and indeed it's something I am um, delighted to speak on. I, I am disappointed that uh, Sinn Féin amendment uh, about empowering, I suppose, both health and education to go further under a duty to cooperate uh, was not accepted. I think that would strengthen today's motion. Uh, but perhaps that's for a different day. Um, <clears throat> can I at the outset congratulate all those volunteers, families, um, educational psychologists, anybody who indeed works day and daily, uh, suffers day and daily when it comes to this issue. Uh, it is an issue that it is very much, I have no doubt, uh, fills up a lot of our inboxes here. Um, I'm not sure what the health minister is doing today. He could be at home playing his PlayStation, or he might be in his constituency office doing a bit of work. If he's in his constituency office, no doubt autism and dealing with the effects of autism will no doubt uh, be in his inbox uh, also. Um, I think it is hugely regrettable, and some people have touched upon this, that we don't have a health minister here today to perhaps reflect on the autism strategy of January 2014, to maybe give a bit of information on the targets, the successes, what has been the failings of that strategy, it's, it is plentiful, uh, and what perhaps is the road ahead. He isn't just letting down the DUP or letting down those of us in here today, he's letting down all those families at home who have to deal with autism on a day and daily basis. So again, I would, I would call, uh, join with colleagues who have said it is hugely regrettable and it is a shame that the Health Minister isn't um, here today. Uh, I think in recent weeks there's been a couple of bills uh, in recent months to go through this House. Uh, that will help to alleviate some of the problems that we've been talking about. Uh, we only have to look at the special education needs bill that has been through. The committee, uh, as, the, as the deputy chair, Sandra Overend, has mentioned, are finishing up our uh, consideration of this bill um, tomorrow. And I think it presents great opportunities 
to streamline the process, to help give families and parents and schools a wee bit power, power back and that we can prioritise the individual, the child and the pupil again over the interests of institutions, because for too long that, that is how it has been. Uh, I, will indeed, yeah. I, I, I thank the member for giving way, and I cer certainly welcome the uh, benefits of the Special Education Needs Bill, but does he not find it regrettable, given the amendment his, his party tried to submit, that it is a bill of the Department of Education and not of the Executive? I thank the member for his intervention. And I think, and again, the Minister for Education has went on record in saying this, and indeed, uh, I know myself and my Sinn Féin colleagues in committee have said this. We'd be more than happy to explore the potential for a duty for the two departments to formally cooperate. I know the member's own private members, but I, I am going to come on to it in a second. Uh, includes such a duty. I think that would be a huge success, not just to have on paper. Uh, and I would maybe go a wee bit further, perhaps, in, in scoping out the success of such a duty that maybe a task force could be immediately established between the two departments to look at the areas where this would be uh, applicable, to look where we would have the early successes. Um, I suppose the establishment, the status quo, will want to say, no, this isn't actually going to help. This is just going to be a hindrance to what we do. But I, I think families at home, there's a need to see something like this happen. So I very much welcome the members, private members, but I, I think it's timely. I think, again, it will go a long way. Uh, I think the duty, uh, the enabling power around the pooling of resources and the sharing of funds is hugely important. Um, we know only too well um, of the huge impact uh, that the you know, Tory austerity is having on our own budgets here in the Assembly um, in times of austerity. It's hugely important that we do more with the public purse. So I think any sort of ability to pull resources uh, would be hugely beneficial in the years uh, ahead. I think another big strength of the Special Education Needs Bill coming is the capacity for schools, or the, the ability of schools to improve upon capacity to deliver. Uh, I would like to see this enhanced in trusts as well. Um, there is one issue I would like to touch upon, and it's maybe a, it's a wider uh, thing that we need to look at in the future. It's around the statement. Uh, to me, anyway, the statement is still not owned by the parent or the, the pupil. Uh, it is still too closely linked to institutions. I would love to break free from this. I would love to see a statement follow the pupil through the pupil's life at school. I, I think it's wrong that it's linked to the institution. Um, and a word of warning, we, we have touched upon today, I suppose, around the shortening of time frames when it comes to these processes. Of course, an unintended consequence of this may be that we shorten the time allowed to a family to actually retrieve complex information that may be vital when it comes to an appeal or when it comes to a process. So I would actually like a wee bit of flexibility built into the system that allows, if a family wants, to have that wee bit of time to get information for the statement and process or for an appeal, uh, that that is built in. And I hope I, 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 I will think the committee will uh, look at something like that. But, but I think the theme really has to be around the duty for departments of health and education to cooperate uh, and to work together. This is something we really need um, to look at. A, a final word just before I finish on the success of Middletown Autism Centre. I think this centre has went from strength to strength. Uh, I, I think recently it has, has also got a very good uh, inspection report. Um, so there's some good things out there. Um, as mentioned by some of my colleagues, the bureaucracy around some of these things is stifling. Families know that only too well. Uh, and hopefully with the SEND Bill, hopefully with the Children's Support Service Cooperation Bill and very other reforms coming down the line, we will start to see improvements in this matter. But it is hugely regrettable that the Health Minister is not here to explain to us how some of this may have looked from his side. Gorm Yogi. Call Mrs Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I also welcome the opportunity to speak on this motion today as a member of the Health Committee and my party spokesperson on health, and also as a former member of the Education Committee. In looking at the systems that are, which are in place for our, our most vulnerable children, it is crystal clear that year on year there is a total lack of joined up approach to the issue of providing appropriate care to children with autism, especially Asperger's. Both departments, education and health, with the Education Authority and the Health Trusts, need to start working together. As we know, this simply isn't happening, and our young people are being let down as a result. It's a total disgrace that so many parents are forced to fight so hard for school-based care for their children. Very often, when they finally get through the process, it's, it is too late as their children have advanced. I have to say, for many vulnerable children, advanced despite the system rather than as a result of it. 
Parents feel trapped into paying for extra support privately and are left wondering how their child's development could have been much better if they just received the right level of support in the first place. Mr Deputy Speaker, these are parents who only want the best care at school for those children who they love and care for themselves at home. Shouldering a burden and responsibility which should be helped, not hindered, by the responsible departments and their policies. Both ministers will be aware that at a constituency level, I have been involved in helping local parents who feel totally and completely let down. The processes take far too long, leaving behind uncertainty, which in itself can and has had a profound effect on children who cannot cope easily with change or who require additional dedicated support, which simply is not being put in place. The Education Minister will also be aware of the provision which has been fought hard for at St Mary's Primary School in Bambridge. The sad fact of that case was that by the time the support and care was discussed, agreed and then eventually begun to be put in place, it was too late for the child whom the original request was raised for. This is totally unacceptable. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a nub of the problem with, with autism provision for our children. The procedural wheels grind far too slowly and parents and their children are frustrated at every single turn. It's not the fantastic teaching staff or carers, it's the processes and procedures which they're forced to operate by. These have led directly to a considerable backlog and are failing and letting down a generation of vulnerable children, both now and in their later life. I support the motion's reference, therefore, to the increasing number of children diagnosed with autism and also the difficulties which they are experiencing in receiving that vital extra support they so urgently need. Members, this is exactly the experience which many of our constituents are dealing with every single day. I therefore support the motion. Call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you. C could I commend the sponsors of this motion bringing this important subject to the House and could I compliment uh, Mr Bradley on his work in leading the um, all-party group on autism, because this is an issue which I think many of us as constituency members are discovering is a far more deep-seated and widespread issue than we ever realized. Uh, certainly I, in my five years uh, running a constituency office as a member of this House, uh, have noticed an increasing volume of parents disaffected by the treatment or the lack of assistance that they've been getting in the education and indeed in the health system in respect of ki kids on the very wide spectrum of autism, uh, which is excessively wide indeed. Uh, and you know, the tragedy is that in years gone by, many of these kids who with the right treatment and support can do actually quite well, and the same goes for kids with dyslexia, they were simply written off as stupid, which was neither fair then nor fair now. Uh, and that which can be done, we, we most certainly do need to do. But the primary point I wanted to make in this debate was the great disparity in facility uh, across the province. There is something of a, of a postcode lottery. Because I asked the sometimes health minister some questions about autism. Uh, and, of course, critical to an assessment, and we had, we had talked this morning about the delays and the scandalous delays that some 900 uh, are waiting beyond the promised 13 weeks, uh, and some have been waiting for a year. Uh, a contributor to that is to establish where are the clinicians uh, located who can deal with these referrals. And I was amazed to discover in this answer uh, from Mr. Hamilton, that though the Northern Trust is the largest board, uh, is the largest health trust uh, in Northern Ireland, that it has only got 11 of the total of 68 clinicians capable of diagnosing, trained to diagnose autism, whereas the Southern uh, Trust has 
23, a third of the total number of clinicians are in the Southern Trust, but in Belfast, there's only 11, in the Northern, only 11, in the Southeastern, only 9, in the Western, only 14. So without a equality of distribution of clinicians to diagnose autism, then the uh, postcode lottery kicks in. And that is why I believe in the northern area, uh, relating it to education, that when the Northeastern Education and Library Board existed, they advised me that uh, in the year 1213, for example, there was a total of 456 requests for uh, statements in respect of those believed to be suffering from autism. Uh, yes? Do you ever agree with me that in some cases this could amount to individual trusts abdicating responsibility for uh, dealing with these issues and that it has a further effect because that is actually leading to lengthening queues on neighbouring trust areas and causing further frustration for those involved? Member in the, additional minute. the member may well be right, but one thing is very clear. When you examine the figures of those who seek, for example, a statement in respect of their educational needs, those who come with referral from the uh, medical uh, experts, from the clinicians, the success rate is far more successful than those that come, for example, with referral simply from the school. So it is quite clear that, that to put your child in the best possible chance of obtaining the statement, you do need the clinical support of, of the clinician. But if there is a dearth of the clinicians, then you are waiting longer to get to that point, and maybe a whole school year can be lost for that child, which at the age at the tender age is a vital component to the, the ability of that child to actually um, catch up and to perform to the optimum of their potential. But what perhaps distressed me the most about the answer from the sometime minister is that having acknowledged the dearth in clinicians uh, and having said in the answer the current number of clinicians trained to diagnose autism is not sufficient to meet overall demand. He then goes on to finish the answer to say that given the current financial constraints, no further investment has been identified to meet this need. So the minister knows, or the, the, sometimes the minister knows of the problem, he knows the ramifications of it, and yet it is not a priority in terms of plugging that gap which obviously, obviously exists, and in particular from someone who represents an area covered by the Northern Trust in terms of bringing some equality of opportunity to that area and others which are affected to make sure there are enough trained clinicians to actually uh, diagnose, uh, because that is the starting point for the treatment of any of these children. Thank you. I call Ms. Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I also welcome the opportunity to speak on the motion and commend my, my colleague Dominic Bradley in particular for his efforts through the uh, all-party group on autism and outside of that group for promoting awareness on this topic. And of course, the, the fruits of his labour was the Autism Act in, in 2011, which came through this assembly and I think which, which brought together all the most progressive uh, elements of legislation from across the islands. And I don't think we can... Um, overstate how groundbreaking that was and how important it was for uh, some 30,000 people in Northern Ireland with autism and their families and their carers in ensuring that they have uh, access to the full range of services they require through their lives. And I know uh, the feedback that I've had on that is that the, the difference it did make on, on raising uh, the level of understanding for families, uh, in particular with, with young children of autism. And just, um, I see even in the hand dryers there, there are signs uh, warning about the noise. And, and I understand that that's, that's uh, to, to raise awareness of the impact that, that some sensory issues might have on young people with autism and that understanding is vital uh, for parents and families as they try and navigate the challenges of, of everyday uh, life and I commend um, as say Dominic and also my, my colleagues uh, Fergal and Sean for bringing uh, the motion and looking at the health and the education aspects and in particular raising awareness of the worrying uh, wait for assessment that people are enduring. Just before the recess the health department published 
published their statistics on autism uh, that showed that 682 children had been referred for uh, an ASD assessment in that quarter and that 407 assessments were completed and it would appear just looking at the figures that that kind of rolling figure of about 250 uh, aren't being picked up per uh, per quarter and those 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 numbers are accruing uh, and, and getting bigger in every quarter and um, members may have seen the uh, statistics from the prevalence of autism in school aged children report that shows that uh, it's gone up 0.9% across all health and social care trusts and up to 2% in the school age population and in very real terms this uh, meant that we've gone up 67% in the children identified with autism spectrum, spectrum disorders from 2009 to 2015 and I think it's natural that we would see some increase through the greater provision of services and the awareness and, and uh, the member before me has referred to just the understanding of things that maybe weren't diagnosed and were put down to, to other issues, but um, I think the, the understanding and the awareness we have simply needs to be matched in investment and services, and that doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, groups like Autism NI and the National Autistic Society have voiced their concerns about the waiting times in diagnosis and, and the failure of the services that follow post-assessment. They uh, polled parents on the length of waiting times, and as members have said, 70% of parents have been waiting uh, for, for, for a diagnosis and that a third of those have waited more than a year. In my own health trust, um, two-thirds of children have been waiting over 18 weeks uh, and, and, and a considerable number for more than a year. And People have spoken. That's a year of families frantically Googling and trying to piece together the information uh, that they need and not having access to and not being formally referred to the services that can improve um, their, their quality of life. And To say that this is challenging for those families is an understatement. I think these, these, these figures are uh, cause for concern for, 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 for parents. I think we need to understand the impact that that uh, diagnosis or even the, the potential that your child has autism has and, and every member will have uh, stories coming to their constituency <coughs> office. So to delay that, to be told that we think that there's a problem with your child and to delay for a year being able to break into um, getting the, the statement and getting the service they need uh, has to end. So I support the motion and ask that all members will lend support to it as well and hope that the Health Minister does come back to work and work with the relevant departments to streamline the services for people with autism and their families. Call Mr Stephen Agnew. Speaker, and, uh, over the last number of years I've highlighted the poor performance um, in terms of delays uh, in diagnosis for children with autism or other special education needs within the South Eastern region. Uh, Mr Alistair has, has brought figures today um, to show South Eastern Region has the, the least number of clinicians uh, qualified to, to diagnose autism. And I think behind the figures is the wasted potential, or at least the risk of, of, of wasted potential. On a day when we hear yet another report being released about educational underachievement, um, I think this is at the crux of that issue. Um, the early diagnosis, early intervention um, of conditions such as autism um, is essential to ensure that every child meets their full potential. Uh, because this isn't the case, uh, I think language is very important often in these debates and, and I know ASD is autistic spectrum disorder is, is a current term of usage within the health service but I know number of people with autism would, would object to the term disorder and prefer condition or simply autistic because of course um, whilst people with autism are not what we would call neurotypical um, we don't want to assume that, that this is a form of, of, of disease or disorder to be treated but indeed um, many celebrated people uh, through our society and, and some notable names Einstein, Mozart, more contemporary, Tim Burton, are often uh, viewed as people who, who, who have had autism and have made a tremendous contribution to our society. And I think each one of us will know um, people within our own lives. Um, you don't have to be famous to, 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 to be brilliant or to be contributing to society. And I think in everyday life, and, and, and I can think of a number of people I know personally with autism who, who um, their condition um, 
actually gives them abilities and, and uh, skills that, that, that can be admired. So it's about sure we put in the support for children in early age um, to ensure that that potential that exists in all children, um, whether autistic or otherwise, um, to, to achieve and to contribute to society and to ensure we do not waste that, that potential. And, and I made reference in my previous intervention to the Special Education Needs Bill. And I do have concerns that something that is so uh, cross-departmental is in fact coming from one department. And indeed, an earlier piece of strategy, the, the early years, um, draft early years strategy, was the genesis of my own private members bill to require cooperation between government departments. And this is the, exactly the type of, of area whereby that cooperation is, in my view, essential. Um, we should have an executive bill for special education needs. It has to be across health and education. And indeed, not only should we be moaning the fact that we don't have the health minister here today, but also the fact that the education minister um, is, is not here to hear the debate. He was e explicitly mentioned in the motion. Um, so if one is not available or choosing not to be in post at this point in time, um, perhaps another minister could step forward for, for children. Um, and those with, with, with autism. I, I, I've seen some good practice, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because I think, I think diagnosis is absolutely important and essential in ensuring the necessary supports are put in place. But we have to assume now, with the increased um, levels of, and knowledge around autism, that in every school class, there is a child with autism. And I've seen in my, my son's own school, uh, Bangor Central Integrated Primary, um, whereby many of the, the, the teaching aids that would be used for a child with autism are being used for the whole class, because indeed the methods of teaching, teaching are valid, um, regardless of whether the child has autism or not. We need to start from the basis of assuming there's an autistic child or autistic children in every class and put no supports in place. But that does not get away from the need for the diagnosis to ensure not just the educational provisions, but the health provisions, and if necessary, the support. For, for families at the home are, are put in place and the resources um, are directed towards the child and the family. But it does need to be cross-departmental, um, the, the, the work in this and getting this right. Um, I hope my own private members bill to require a duty for government to cooperate um, will help in that regard and we can start to tackle the historical problem of the delays in diagnosis for, for autism. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers to wind up the debate on the motion. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I welcome the opportunity to wind in this debate and reflect the concerns outlined by my colleagues and by the House as a whole. I suppose at the outset I would like to acknowledge the great work of the Middleton Centre that they do with autism. But first I want to comment on uh, educational aspects of treating a child with autism. I am aware as education spokesperson of the, of the Special Education Needs and Disability Bill that many other people have spoken of today that is currently making its way through the House. I hope that that can in some way help with some of the broader educational deficiencies associated with special education needs and autism in particular. Many people have spoken of the statistics today, but it is estimated that over 3,500 children of school age and over 20,000 adults in Northern Ireland that currently have autism. I think these statistics that have been quoted today are, are crucially important as professionals and researchers agree that early intervention and diagnosis is essential to improving the developmental and education outcomes of the children with autism. The, the autism strategy, as many members have re referenced today, says the following about education. Firstly, to continue to build the capacity in schools to effectively meet the needs of children and young people with autism. There are multiple issues that arise when considering this point, Mr. Speaker. Can we say that currently our capacity for dealing with special education needs within our schools is appropriate and fitting? We cannot. In fact, within many rural schools with a small number of children, there is under-provision. I'm aware of situations where our school has been allocated eight hours per year to see an education psychologist. How is that addressing the special education needs of a school that has 70 or 80 children? This is outside the spectrum of health, of course, as these are provided by the Education Authority. How can a child or a collection of children benefit in a tangible way from so little uh, help? 
The second point is to provide effective support to parents and carers of children and young people with autism, to ensure they are involved and informed regarding their child's education. Parents need to be supported throughout the diagnosis and subsequent process for children and young people with autism. This comes not just through health and social care, but crucially through the school. We need to make sure that all teachers and classroom assistants are cognizant of the challenges facing, facing them and always act with the best in the interest of the child at heart. The third point is to formalise collaboration between health and social care and the education sector to help improve support, including specialist support and expand transdisciplinary assessment interventions and support for children and young people with complex need. This is particularly important, Mr. Speaker. This issue cannot be tackled by either the health or education alone, and it is a joint approach that will necessarily drive weighting this down to promote early intervention when educating and caring for the child with autism. Furthermore, as reflected in this debate today, funding is a key issue in driving the autism strategy and a broader special education needs legislation that I hope to see this year. And now I would like to, say I would like to thank all, all people for their, for their contributions today. And if we just start off with Dominic as chair of the, the, the All Party Group and a strong advocate for the good services within autism. He stressed very much the need for a cross-departmental approach, that it was a de developmental disability. We need, joint, we need joined up work there. We need equality for all our children. Because our child has autism, they should have the same access to the whole education system as any, any other child. He put a strong emphasis on early intervention, on diagnosis and on statementing. Many members spoke about the minister today. And again, just like cancer services yesterday, we have no minister across. This is a real shame. It's a real shame for the children with autism. It's a real shame for the waiting list and a real shame for the parents out there. We need somebody at the helm. Maeve McLaughlin, uh, and I agree fully with her, we need a, a more formal duty between health and education to, to address the special education needs. Maeve said that Clause 4 needs to be much stronger. And when she said that much of the, the delay uh, is at, at the door of health, there certainly is a, a big delay at education as well. She, she also quoted many statistics. And many people talked about a six-month delay or a year delay. Think of what that means to a four- or five-year-old child. It may be six months or a year in the chronological age, but what about their education development, their education attainment? What is, what is lost within that period of time? Maybe two years, maybe longer. Maybe something that they'll have great difficulty in actually ever, ever catching up on. Sandra Overend, as vice chair of the, of the committee, like all, like all other MLAs here, is inundated with complaints from frustrated parents. She had talked about the wonderful protocols, but the wonderful protocols are not borne out in reality. Like, like us, with two or three parents arriving at our door, door every week, and it's that stress, that stress in the parents, stress in the children. Kieran McCarthy, a long-standing member of the, of the all-party working group today, rightly congratulated the work of autism in Northern Ireland. And maybe at this, this stage, we'd just like to have some reference to the, the Autism Act, because a lot of people mentioned the Autism Act today. And, you know, when we met at the all-party group today, they really did stress that, you know, there are two very important parts of this, the Autism Act that, that, that have, never, have never got anywhere, and that is an advocate of autism and autism budget. There's no independent scrutiny of the, of the Autism Act, and there's no separate budget. It, it depends on uh, getting money from the learning disability budget. Yes, I will. Way. Um, the Autism uh, 2011 Act was very important, um, but at that time the department were against it. Were against it. Now, would you agree with me that this would be an opportune time for the department to do something in relation to the, the speeches that was made today to prove that they are now on board with the Autism Act once and for all? Wholeheartedly with, with, with Kieran on that, and uh, I think it's, it's the United Message that goes out from this. We really need a department here to act. You know, if we were to compare services pre and post legislation, I think it would be very interesting. Um, I think we'd know what the answer was. You know, with limited finance from learning disability budget and an increasing number of children with autism, our, our, our children get us, you know, 70% of those waiting over a year. How good is that in, this mo in the mo in modern age? 
And it's notable too that much of the innovation and the development work that's been done around Alstom has come from the voluntary sector. You know, the statutory side is very much lagging behind in that, in that development work. And then I'll go on to um, Michaela Boyle focused on the associated bureaucracy. And whether that's the teacher in the school or the parent, um, you know, you're, they're just so frustrated with, it, with the amount of bureaucracy. She also said that recommendations are not being thoroughly implemented. There needs to be evaluations. You know, having an evaluation or review every three years, uh, no use, it needs to be at least every year. She stressed also we need a mechanism to reduce the waiting times. Further training and development is necessary for, for our teaching and our support staff, which I agree with. Yeah. Um, then my colleague Fergal um, uh, talked about autism as, as developmental disability. Diagnosis is key. Without diagnosis, we can't have this early intervention. If this diagnosis and getting these appointments and so on is going to take a year and so on, how, what's happening inside that child's mind and the frustrations and so on the parents have as well? He also mentioned the, the damning statistic. He spoke about a, a, a child within his constituency, Adam, six months for an appointment. Six months for an appointment before anything could be addressed. He used the words tearing the family apart. And we just can think all of our own children and our own families. Let's, let's get into the shoes of that parent, of those parents. Really tearing the whole thing apart. Totally frustrated. Chris Hazard um, um, talked about empowering both departments to provide a duty of care. And that's coming across very strongly from a lot of people. Need. It's very regrettable we have a health minister here today. And it have been useful also to have our education minister here as well. He holds out hopes for this SEN bill. And about the pooling of resources and sharing of funds would be very important. He made a, a very relevant point about statement following the pupil, irrespective, and I would say irrespective of where they go. Because very often our post-primary children decide at 16 that maybe the best place to go is to a further education college. There's no, it's, it's a different set of provision altogether than a further education college at the same school. So if the statement was following and staying with the child, it would be very, very appropriate. Joanne Dobson um, talked about the total lack of a joined up approach. Parents want the best for their child, just as, as I as a parent want the best for my children. And parents are, are totally uh, um, exacerbated about the whole situation. The, pro, the, the process just grinds far, far too slowly. Letting down, we are letting down a, gen, a, a generation of children. Jim Allister uh, 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 talked about, you know, that again, every child, if there was the right intervention, every child can do well. He talked about the great disparity between the different boards, about the, the level of intervention and so on. And I'll take one example, for example. Um, so just, and then just, um, Claire Hanna quoted the damning statistics as well. And suppose just finally, I would just like to thank everybody for their contribution. And I think there's a message go out from around this house to the minister today that, that, that autism needs to be addressed properly, quickly. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it.